Yeah, as far as being argumentative or antagonistic, I, I just don't want you to think, I mean, a lot of times I'm calling in Josh and you, but I don't want you or the listeners for that matter. I don't want the listeners to think that I'm really think you're a bad GM. I wouldn't play with you if I didn't enjoy your GM style. So I, I hope you and the listeners do know I'm joking around and I, I guess I'll stop joking because not everybody, maybe not you, but maybe not all your listeners appreciate my dry sense of humor. I doubt that I have lost any listeners because of your sarcastic wit. And I know, I think I know you're joshing me most of the time. Sometimes it doesn't click, but uh, generally you will tell me, hey, that wasn't really what I meant. And I was a little sarcastic um, and it works, right? So no worries, no harm, no foul. Just any cliche related to that type of sentiment. And uh, we move on, right? But that's an important distinction because sometimes people try to be funny and it doesn't come across. It comes across as mean-spirited and unhelpful. And again, sometimes I fail to be able to distinguish it. So who knows? But uh, yeah, I don't. I guess since I know you and we sat and talked a lot and had beers together, it doesn't. It seems easier to interpret your humor. But then again. You know, all my score of listeners, um, they might not know you as well as I do. So uh, when you sit, and then it could be confusing, like when you say, that's not a bad thing, whatever. It could be confusing when you say, oh, GM Extraordinaire. You know, I like playing your games and then I was saying what I do wrong. Ha! Huh. Which is, I guess, okay. It helps me to get better if I really do something wrong. Or it makes me roll my eyes if I was like, well, that's really not wrong. Just, you know, you know, kind of the way gameplay goes or something that you might not like but is part of the game, right? Anyway, on to your next stuff. I had your last call first and your first call last. No, second. All right. Hey, Carl, Jason here. So I hear what you're saying. You you weren't happy that you guys failed to succeed in Warhammer. And yeah, I got no problem taking, just out of curiosity, taking it offline. But I I think players aren't always going to succeed, right? And, and I think that's okay. I think it's okay to fail a mission in a role-playing game. And now that you mention it, though, yeah, because you talked about you know, fit or losing at RPG. So losing would be not doing the mission, but maybe that's a problem with doing pre-written adventures and adventure paths and modules because they have an expected win point where if you're not playing those things, if you're playing a, a sandbox, there's no expected win condition other than surviving. Right. But if you're playing whatever module, then you have some artificial win condition that will never survive the contact with artificial win condition that will never survive first contact with the players. And when the players want to make decisions and deviate, the module doesn't, a lot of times modules won't allow for that. So that that may be an issue there Um, because the win condition might've been containing whatever you're fighting in more. I I don't know because I don't know the game. I don't know the the specifics of that campaign, that Warhammer fantasy campaign. But yeah, I, I, I think there's something to run away and fight another day kind of thing. I don't know. But but I hear what you're saying. And, um, yeah, it can be frustrating when you try to do something in a game and, and you, you fail. But, I mean, that model's real life too, right? We, we're not always successful. So, you know, even on the big scale, look at Market Garden, World War Two, right? Anyway, I will listen to the rest of your episode. Hey, Jason, thanks for the calls. And I think, yeah, I mean, most – adventures nowadays they don't have one path to the solution but there is a solution and is that a good thing or a bad thing it's hard to say i mean you give the players a lot of choices this is true i don't know i want to when i play especially if i play in a warhammer fantasy game for example and we know chaos is bad and your character has that idea that chaos is bad then you want to defeat it whether you live or die. 
So maybe it was a bit, um, a bit biting off more than one can chew. But, um, but I mean, it just works differently. Also, like in, it worked differently in the uh, the live game, you know. And maybe again, it's just all the players are have bought in to the idea that we're going to defeat this and some and um it's not like some players are wishy-washy about it um and have their characters just throw all their cards in i mean in the warhammer fantasy game that i run i guess the players could have left once they knew that their demonic incursion was imminent but they decided not to so i thought that was kind of neat yeah, there'll be a recap later about their ongoing adventures in this episode, so we can discuss that there. In any case, um, yeah, I mean, maybe it is better as as I get older that I'd rather play in things that aren't scripted or that there's an end game. I mean, I don't play as much as I run. And running, well, yes, the pre-planned adventures are helpful, but more again, like like for example, as I will discuss later in the show too, I enjoy the DCC fantasy. And while the points or the plot, not the plot points, not a plot point, the encounters locations might be scripted, like how you get there and what you do there is not part of an overall adventure path. And maybe that's the cool thing is that you kind of string these encounters together to make a story an emergent story as opposed to a pre-written story that you got to follow, which I think is uh, the cool part, right? And a good adventure will, a good adventure or a good well-designed adventure will make it seem that you're not following a, a railroad train, railroad track, or a plot point, but you can get to that place in different directions. Okay, I got a package, which means an unboxing. So I will unbox it. It is a uh, one of those sort of eight and a half by like seventeen or so. Maybe it's eleven. Yeah, like eleven by seventeen. What was that? legal size uh, media mail box from Tennessee so pretty cool it's got a lot of perforations so maybe it'll be easy to pop open right without the use of anvil so I pop it open and then there's an inner envelope inside and pretty cool. That oddly it's a FedEx envelope inside. So that one's perforated also, so I'll just tear that open. Hey, that's kind of cool. No um no blades drawn in this unboxing. So the FedEx envelope is open and inside is our kind of a4 zine sized Dungeon Crawl Classics, The Lost City of Baraku. So, A City at the Center of Earth by Harley Stroh, which seems pretty cool. Journey to the Center of Earth, kind of neat. Love it. So, it is, like I said, zine size. It's about 44 pages, uh, looks pretty neat. I've always liked the DCC style. And I kind of like the smallish format, that's kind of neat. Um, to me, these are easier to, to go. Very cool. Oh, um, it is for, just FYI, I 
I didn't think it was for low level characters but I mean it doesn't look like it interesting interesting so good stuff I believe it's for higher level characters it doesn't really specify so I will have to be right back. Well, it seems that it is meant for sixth level characters, but it is kind of like uh, you are here, you're outside the city in this wasteland, uh, approach the city, and then it consists of a series of random tables on the city architecture, uh, many bestiary of what kind of creatures you might you will find in the lost city, and encounter tables for that city. I think the draw are is the archives or the library of Baraco and in it is a very strange library and it shows you what you might find so it's a kind of like a sandboxy adventure uh, with somewhat of a purpose but a very open-ended so it's almost like uh, you get here and this is a setting which I think is kind of cool and maybe or maybe not I'll use it but I like DCC stuff I think I just got it on a whim because um looking for some like a just in case maybe it might be one of the things at the end of a portal who knows we'll see okay should i do last recap first or first recap last i mean the sound of the engine suggests maybe something spacey so let's do last recap first this morning i ran a game of dcc fantasy with my buddies arlen walker of live from pelham's wasteland dj boyd of the arcane alienist and jason connerly of nerd rpg variety cast and in the last tale, they had defeated some or destroyed the altar of some god that was an anathema to the patron of Idris, Jason's character. A sandstorm blew up the manifestation of Jason's character's patron. They ran down the mound to take shelter in the grotto with the enameled portal. Uh, I had asked him beforehand because I didn't want to prep for three things. So I asked him, which portal are you going to take? They decided blue. They had visited before. There was a circle of standing stones in the forest that they had checked out. Um, so they, so BJ's character, Burnfried, activated the portal by walking on the pattern. And then they realized that they had a certain amount of time, 30 heartbeats by their last reckoning and test. And they walk through, and as soon as they walk through, all these two armed plant creatures started attacking them. And uh, it was a rousing fight. Uh, Idris enlarged Ardath with his new weapon, the Sword of the Moon Kings, or the Thrice Cursed Sword, however you want to interpret it, and was cutting down these plant things as if they were sheaves of wheat or a wheat like substance. Um, Otto was getting beat up and Burnfried healed him. Idris burned one. Idris blinded some. He made sure that the animals didn't run away. They're, they had brought their animals through. The two bogas and a camel. Um, the place, when, when they finally defeated the creatures, one did run away, howling blind into the forest. Um, but they, uh, they realized that the place was colder. Um, what, a much wetter but they you know they're in a forest so they really couldn't tell you know, what the astronomy was and it was still during the day um but uh and they were here to the in the forest the forested hills to the northwest of them were mountains rising um so Arda said well i'd rather walk downhill than up so they walked downhill and soon as soon as they could see down below into the valley they saw a um a lake, and upon the lake was a castle. As they approached the castle, there was no one around, um, which was odd. 
The forest was very strange. It was old growth forest, um, but not a lot of animals. Um, at least not a lot of like mammals. There are birds in the in the trees and such, but no rabbits or deer or anything that anything that you know, no spore or anything of those types of animals, which was odd. Um, they had no idea why these plant creatures attacked them when they came out of the gate this time. Uh, the scorpion that they had dragged through was still there, the carcass of the scorpion, um, there and rotting. Um, some time may have passed, but not a lot. So they get down to the castle. It is overgrown with vines. The moat is mud and mucky, but the drawbridge is down, and there are these two statues that have this conversation, effectively saying, uh, leave. Uh, they see a rune on this, on these statues, and while three of the characters are examining that, Otto is looking near the bank of the moat, and some ferns start to animate and start attacking him, but he and some other of the players dispatch it, cut it down. Idris actually shot an arrow at it and jacked it up, and Otto, the dwarf, cut it down. Otto is played by another player um, who does not have a podcast, but he plays with us a lot. Um, he is on the discords a lot, too. Uh, so that's why he plays a lot of our games, which is cool. And he plays Otto the Dwarf. Eventually, they try to uh, dispel this rune, um, and they. The first attempt is Jason's character puts a an alarm rune, but it's not enough to disrupt the strength of the current rune that's on there. And then Arlen tries to takes a crowbar and tries to pry pry the stones from behind it. The first time doesn't quite succeed. He keeps trying, and the second time, unfortunately, he stumbles into the path of the the two runes on these statues, and kabam, kaboom, some sort of thunder wave, lightning bolt strikes him. It hurts. Um, the drawbridge, the doors of the gate across the drawbridge, across the moat, open, and all these plant-like creatures, these two-armed, they have faces in the middle of their bodies, start running at them. Um, like a score of them or so. And a uh, crazy epic melee ensues. If you can imagine, I did. The immigrant song playing in the background. Uh, that's how I felt it. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm sure Jason will talk about this more. I hope he does. He tried to cast a spell that could have been hella awesome, but it wasn't as successful, though he did knock down. Uh, it did draw, turn, it did, on the front line, he did knock them unconscious. Um, that was actually a little later. The first thing that happened is Ardeth walked across um, the drawbridge and he hit a trap that was in the middle of the bridge. He thought he'd get jacked up again with lightning, but no, the the plank on the drawbridge pivoted and he was dumped and he slid unceremoniously into the water. Um, and then he started. He had to swim through the bank. There was no way to get up on the moat. He didn't take any damage, but it was kind of funny. Uh, Jason tried, the, the creature's, run across the bridge. Uh, Otto is standing there. He holds the line, but four of them can get into attack. Um, Jason's character casts his color spray, and it is effective, but not as effective as he had wanted to be. He burns some of his lifeblood in the process, but uh, it is but a whimper. His patron might be upset at him. Burn Freed, on the other hand, stands there, and he. I thought it was kind of cool when BJ asked, hey, these are plant creatures. Are they like unnatural? Are they an ant? Would they be an anathema? And I look and I say, yeah. Um, I look at the stats of the creature and how they're created. And I said, yeah, this is, this is a perversion uh, for your God. So um, I thought that was a great question to ask and it seemed to make, to work and make sense. And Burnfried rolled really well and Holy Smite light came through. He shot this Holy fire at the creatures on the bridge, knocking them into the moat um, and knocking and having some flee back into the castle in, ca in a disarray. Uh, there are still others, though. There is a score of them. He only turned 13, which is pretty amazing. In the water, this, there is things in the water, and as our death swam to the shore, these killer frogs kind of probably attracted by all these splish splashes into the water um, start attacking, but uh, they are distracted by these plant creatures who are turning and trying to flee and scrabble through the water away from Burnfried. Um, there are some left, like I said, as Ardath is trying to get back to, to the fight. 
Otto gets taken down. And this was great. We had so many crits and fumbles in this game. I, I mean, that's a fun aspect, but I mean, it's only supposed to be, what, a, a 5% chance, but it seemed a lot. Um, I, you know, see Jason rolled a crit. Uh, a couple of people got critical fumbles. I got a double critical when I attacked Otto on the bridge. And he, he was brained, and a dagger went into his skull and face, and he was dropped. And Burnfried then had healed him up and rolled amazingly again. I'm going to have to check uh, BJ's virtual dice because he was rolling like gangbusters. But that happened sometimes. So he healed him up. And then as a consequence of one of the crits, uh, the condition was that he would get knocked unconscious, like hitting the head with a mace. But uh, Otto the Dwarf has a hard head, and he did not succumb to the he had not succumbed to the unconsciousness he was just kind of dropped so he pops up and is able to get back into the fight um they defeat the ones that had ran across the bridge and that close uh, close and run and ardath is there he and both he and otto are enlarged by idris and this time they run across the bridge making sure to jump over the pivoting plank and they hold the line inside the gate the rest of the others come through Ardas slices through a two or three uh, with his mighty Sword of the Moon Kings, and uh, they're able to enter into the castle. They hear f a lot of commotion, of course, because there's alarms and horns and all sorts of things. The next room that they can see, smoke is coming from it. It's some sort of fest hall, and creatures are cavorting and dancing to get themselves into a frenzy. Among the creatures, this horde of more plant things are is a a, uh, an older woman who is green with stringy hair that they realize is some sort of hag. So that's where we stopped. It was really epic and hella fun as they stormed the castle. And who said that storming the castle wasn't fun? All right. It hasn't come out yet, and it probably will either come out tomorrow or Wednesday. But Jason Connerly has also done a session report and I'm not calling it quite a recap because he said he's going to cover other topics probably related to um, gameplay more than I did. So, um, yeah, I think um, I think you should go check that out if you don't already. And that's Jason Connerly at Nerd Variety RPG Cast. Coming soon to a podcast platform near you. Last Thursday night, we started Death on the Reich, part two of the epic Enemy Within campaign for Warhammer Fantasy. They've made a fourth, or they've made it, uh, recreated it from the first edition adventure to a fourth edition version. And I just, I love it. I like Warhammer a lot. I've invested in the deluxe versions of them. That is a box that has very amazing covers of both the adventure and then a companion that each adventure comes with. I actually order them um, through Dragon's Lair here in San Antonio, the medical center one, and they order them for me, and it's really cool. What I like about Cubicle 7 is they also have a bits and mortar program, and you might hear purring from my cat in the background, um, but the bits and mortar gets you the PDFs as well uh, if you buy the physical product from uh, a gaming store, which is very cool. So I thought I'd plug Dragon's Lair San Antonio again. Um, I might actually put a link on this in their Facebook, which would be kind of neat. Um, they <laughs> said I could do it, which would be good. Maybe it'll get me some more uh, more followers, right? So at the beginning of the adventure, I decided to do a lot of bookkeeping, catch, let the players catch up on endeavors, which allows them to like level up in their career. Or, for example, the knight of Morastra, who has this menagerie of animals, decided to get actually get animal training so he could train his animals to do more things than they do. He has a draft horse, a, a destrier war horse, a beautiful riding horse, and a, a hunting dog named Fang. And Fang is always the hero of the story. Um, he helped destroy the demon and kill the sorcerer in the last uh, in their last turn time that they played. So they had left Bogenhofen. They left in the uh, Bellinelli which is uh, Uncle Joseph, one of the characters, quote-unquote, uncles. Um, and he, they, a couple of the characters work on the boat, gain some money. 
but they, you know, they just go up, up. Actually, they're going uh, downriver back towards Altorf. Uh, they found a note among the possessions of the bad cult people. So they're going to go to Altorf and then go upriver towards Nuln to find out, find this lair and deal with this, um, with this thing. The other cool endeavors that people took, they did some investment. And both of the, the uh, courtier type characters, the lawyer and the other, uh, the, I think he is a courtier actually, they decided to take uh, uh, an endeavor called standing, which gives them, a, they are treated as a level better in their social standing for the duration of the adventure, which will I guarantee will come in very handy. And it does make sense because they are sort of agents, if not, they are friends, if not agents of uh, Primus von Bildhofen, who is the son of the uh, Grand Duke, I think it's Gustav, Gustavus von Bildhofen of Karaberg, who is an important person, uh, one of the emperor's trusted uh, Grand Dukes so uh, from Middenheim. So it's pretty cool. Uh, we did a lot of that bookkeeping. It's just fun to hang out with these guys anyway, right? So, so then they travel down the river. Oh, they also, um, what else did they do? Oh, the uh, Ulrich, uh, the Unstoppable, who is, all, who is a boatman, got to go from boat hand to boat man, um, trying to negotiate with Yosef um, and invest some money into the boat because you can make improve. The cool thing about the Death on the Right Companion, it talks about trading and it also talks about how to improve your boat. Um, so I, it's a, I think it's a, these adventures are well-written. Uh, they don't lead the characters, but they really give the characters a lot of foreshadowing, I would say. Anyway, we go through some of the procedural to travel down river so they get used to it. Um, it is, they go, so there's like a, a mechanic also in the Death on the Right Companion where it tells you how to do river travel, um, which is kind of neat. It, it's an addendum to what's in the main book. So they it takes them about three and a half days, they estimate, to get from uh, Bogenhofen down um, river to Weisenbrook. Um, about the third day, it's generally uneventful. They hear some rumors about various things going on in the in the empire. Um, and then, you know, there's a big edict that the emperor has declared that you cannot just kill a mutant for looking a person for looking like a mutant for deformities if you do that it is punishable by punishable by death so they hear about that edict that has been proclaimed um on bottom of the third day they see a, a dead body in the water and this leads to seeing a, like a boat floating in the water with multiple dead bodies on it so they heroes take action um they drive their own boat the bellinelli close to this abandoned boat and Marastra and Fang jump across. Uh, one of the characters spies a winged creature in the in the trees along the bank. This winged creature flies out and uh, shoots at the characters. Misses. The characters shoot back and injure it, but it still keeps on. Uh, two mutants pile out from underneath from the um, from the boat. For I guess from the inside of the boat um, onto the deck and fight Marastra, but Marastra dispatches them e relatively easily. Uh, with he and Fang, just you know, they fight them off. They defend it really well against him, and then fight him off um, and take him down, which is kind of neat. So uh, meanwhile, back on the boat, this tentacled mutant who is hiding in the water tries to grab. Uh, Ulrich, who is steering the boat, um, and is, grabs him, but is unable to drag him into the water. Uh, the other two characters they shoot down and just and kill as it's trying to flee. Um, this winged mutant, which crashes into the water, and they help um, they help Ulrich deal with the tentacled one, and uh, they do pretty well. There are some. Um, so injury, no one gets dropped. Um, one of the characters has to maintain his resilience as it is feared by the creature, the strange meat tentacle mutant man. Um, they cut off its tentacles, they stab it, they rip it with, with the gaff hook, and it sinks to the bottom. And for good measure, one of the players shoots it with a bow. 
Um, they don't chase it into the water, but it looks kind of dead. And then they uh, they ex- explore the boat. They get some salvage. They claim salvage rights on the boat, which is great. So now Ulrich the Unstoppable can have his own boat, which I did not know was a short-term goal of his. So that's very cool. Uh, they find that someone hiding on the boat, um, a a woman named Renata, and Renata says, "Thank you so much. I'll help you, you know, get this boat going for trade." Uh, so yeah, it's pretty cool. So they managed to get. So I guess we did do a lot, even though uh, I feel like we did a lot of bookkeeping at the beginning, because after this encounter, they made it to Weisenbrook, and uh, uh, in the previous adventure during Schaffenfest. They had met an herbalist named Elvira. Elvira said, hey, when you get to Weisenbrook, come and visit. Um, so a couple characters go there. A couple characters go to um, claim the salvage on the boat and, of course, give it a name. I think they call it the Endurance. Uh, endurance seems to be a very important, important stat for them. So an homage to that. Um, so Ulrich and uh, Sebastian, the lawyer, go and take care of that. Sebastian runs into people uh give small talk uh, peddlers that are selling dried fish. Uh, they give him strange signs, which he reports back. They shake his hand and uh, it's, their hands are covered in purple dye and they, his hand becomes purple. Uh, they say something cryptic um, and he goes, okay. Uh, he does not know what it means, but uh, remember he is, Sebastian is a doppelganger of that person they found on the road way back. So these cultists of the purple hand think he is a cultist. So I don't know, we don't know, he doesn't know if they're giving him a warning or they're saying, hey, what's up? We'll meet later. Um, So who knows what's going on there? It's very mysterious. But they know this Purple Hand cult is out there and are somewhat responsible for what happened in Bogenhofen and they want to pursue it because it is a threat, they feel, to the Empire and their friend Primus because he's, you know, their friend now. I'm, I guess I'm trying to think of what their well, their motivation, of course, is to complete the adventure. But I think their characters are developing uh, motivations for it too. Even, for example, if Reginald, who was once the courtier and is now actually a duelist, I forgot about that. He's become a duelist, and he's getting very, very, very proficient. So, meanwhile, after even though uh, Sebastian and Olg had this weird encounter, they just went back to the boat. Reginald and Marastra. They go to Elvira's place. It looks like it's abandoned. It's abandoned. They look inside. There seems to have been it been tossed. Elvira is not there. The window is broken. Uh, Reggie kind of sneaks in, open unlocks it for Marastra, and they search the house. It looks like uh, Elvira has been kidnapped, maybe, or she's not there, or has fled, and her place has been ransacked. So they search around the whole house, and they they find a hidden cellar. In the cellar is someone they believe or tells them that she is Elvira's niece um, and uh, that Elvira was taken by some rough smelly men they talked about an inn called the happy man so uh, they take the girl back to the boat and hook up with the others and decide what they're going to do next probably go visit the happy man and find their friend Elvira so she's taken to something called the red barn which is very ominous. So we'll see. Uh, this person has helped them in the past, gave them some really cool concoctions to stave away everything from a uh, disease to uh, being hung over. And um, yeah, they're, they're, she is their friend and they want to go help. Good heroic motivation. I love it. And that's that was our game. I had a good time. For the last segment of this podcast, I just kind of wanted to give a state of the game sort of update. I don't know how rambly this will be, but I just wanted to give like an update of what's going on in my life and what games I'm running and whether or not they might be affected by some changes going on in my life. So I worked for this place at a university for a very long time. I am not working there anymore. I've moved on to be working outside of academia and into industry. I've gotten a job. I'm not going to name it, but it is very different. Um, It is still scientifically based. It is going to require me to learn very new techniques, very new techniques, not just in science, but in um, marketing, which I've always loved, um, in 
promotion and public speaking and all that kind of stuff, I am, I feel like, while I did enjoy the job and I do enjoy academia, I feel like in this particular place, I was kind of in a bubble and this job is going to allow me to, you know, reach out. It is an international company. The, the employee ship is very diverse uh, both gender and both in gender and in ethnicity and even in like nationality, which is amazing and fantastic. And academia has definitely suffered. It suffers from a lack of diversity and as much dog whistling as many universities give, they do not promote. They try to promote diversity, but there's no equity at all. And um, they're way behind in doing this and making a more, I don't know, it's, it's 2021, you know, that's the kind of the way of the world and um, academia is socially behind, right? That's all I can say. So that's my comment and my opinion and my observation and experience. But to, Hey, I'm very excited. I get to travel more. Um, I still get to be in science, which is awesome. And I guess maybe it goes down to, you know, that that quote by by uh, Christ in the New Testament. I don't remember exactly the book and verse, but you're never a prophet in your own town, right? So, uh, and I feel like that's might have happened. I've worked, I was a graduate student and then a postdoc and then faculty at the same university. And uh, I think I, it might not have been the best or ideal situation. I probably should have gone elsewhere um, for my faculty position because honestly, it's like there are some old fac older faculty who would still treat me like a grad student, and that does not help when it comes to a lot of things, uh, support and uh, a feeling of community or of uh, camaraderie. So I'm really again, I'm really excited about this this job. I'm not going to name it, uh, but hey, if you're on my LinkedIn, you'll figure it out. Um, and again, it involves travel, and travel might interrupt some of the games. So I think it's good to really evaluate the games and where they are and uh, see how this goes. So I think I have a plan to maybe um, a friend of mine who is also in this type of job said that it's probably good to travel part of the week if you need to travel and then set things up during the remainder of the week. So I would probably want to be back I would say by the end of the week and do my traveling in the front end, but we'll see how it works. You know, just, it is dependent on, on trade shows that I might have to go to on conferences that I have to attend. So, um, and right now still a lot of conferences are virtual and the company is not going to attend any virtual conferences because it's really not worth it. You know, people don't often go to like a, a static poster session in these virtual conferences there's no way or it's very, very minimal that they're going to go to, you know, a, a vendor platform that's static. So anyway, let's see. So I'm just going to go in order of the games that I'm running. I'm not going to talk about the games that I'm playing in because I probably will still be able to participate in those because there's not a lot of prep and only travel schedule will get out of the way. I think on every other Tuesday I run a Twilight 2000 game with the fourth edition. And that's an ongoing game. And I think we have a good solid crew. Um, we have at least uh, three dedicated players, uh, up to five, maybe six sometimes, just depending on their schedules. And we're probably adding another player, which would be neat. And just the nature of it makes it really easy for a player not to show up. Uh, you can really tailor things to you know the crew that's there and the rest are back with the camp or in the convoy. Um, so I really enjoy that game. I have a plan. They're almost out of the first phase um, that I've called Breakout, and they're almost in Krakow. And in Krakow, it's going to be a little easier to, you know, to do things. It's not going to be so much resource management and, and trekking around um, this part of Poland to avoid Soviet and Polish patrols. It's going to be, you know, more of a intrigue, film noir, Casablanca-ish feel, um, but set in a, 
sort of modern day, what year 2000, right? So I'm pretty looking forward to that, and it'll be a good new phase of the game. I hope that one's not affected. It is played online, so even if I'm out of town, it should be doable, right? Unless you have, sometimes you have, in this type of job, sometimes you have obligations and you got to uh, do the schmoozing and go out to dinner. Um, so we'll see. Um, we'll see how this goes. So uh, Wednesday, on the opposite Wednesday that I run T2K, so not back-to-back, is I'm running um, Starfinder, and we're running Horizons of the Vast Adventure Path, and we're still in the first adventure. I feel like we're still trying to feel our way around the adventure with all, there's some procedural and domain play that uh, we haven't quite figured out, and I'd like to get to more action, but I, you know, I gotta be on top of that. That is, well, I like that game. That is a game that could could suffer just depending on on the vibe and the feel of it, Um, but again, it's online, so it can be, um, doable given the circumstances the opposite wednesday uh, we're planning on starting a pathfinder 2e game and we haven't decided on which adventure path there are a couple that i really like um and we're deciding whether we want to play like a short short one that still gets you up to level 10 or a long-term one that goes beyond that so it's still in discussion phase and and we'll see hopefully it'll get off the ground It's, it's online again so not really as much affected by travel unless it's a travel day, right? Or schmoozing. And uh, Thursday, Thursday, the Thursday game, every uh, other week is live Warhammer Fantasy. And that's going really well. And that one could suffer depending on travel. I don't think it'll fall apart if I miss a session or two because of travel. Um, But... I mean, it's not a Thursday, so you know it's going to suffer from like you know Thanksgiving and holidays as the holiday season approaches. But uh, you know, it's a good group. We've been playing together for a long time, so I don't think it'll it'll get dropped, but it might suffer. And I hope it does not, because we're on the second book now, um, as you heard. And it's God, it's a really fun game and campaign, and it's a really great group of guys. So um, yeah, the opposite of that, we're really trying our Audio Dungeon Discord, Rotating GM Ship, the opposite Thursdays. And I think I'll still be able to do that. It's online. Um, and again, no prep for the most part since we rotate the GM ship around. But I will probably will not GM um, if I can help it uh, for, for some time until things get settled in the new job. So that's great because I'll let uh, Jason and Arlen and... Um, and who else? Oh... Joe, Richter, and Daniel, and anyone else who's part of that group to uh, get some games in and run for us, right? So uh, that would be pretty neat. So on the weekend, the game that I definitely am looking forward to keeping and holding on, as you might have heard in the tone of my voice and excitement, is the DCC Fantasy that's every other weekend. And... uh, I'm hoping that for the most part I will be at home on the weekends, but it's online. Have computer, will game, right? So uh, we'll see. And then Sunday, um, yeah, it's the same thing with Sunday. I don't run any games. I play any game. Oh, I guess the game that could really suffer is my every other Friday game uh, of East Texas University. Um, this We're missing one session this upcoming week because I'm going to be out of town. But again, it's it's also scheduled during the day. Maybe we can move around the time frame depending on who's playing. Um, it was scheduled during the day to accommodate people in the UK and Europe, but uh, that person is not playing anymore, has dropped out. So we might move it to a more reasonable time, like in the evening uh, US, US territory, right? So, so we'll see. I like that game a lot. Uh, my wife might be joining it too. So that's some incentive to keep playing. So, um, yeah, so that's the state of what's going on. I'm hoping to keep these games running, but, uh, you know, they'll they'll suffer because of the sudden new work that i got to put a lot of attention into because um, it's, it's brand new, you know, it's brand new stuff. It's very exciting. But, uh, yeah, I might be a smart cookie, so I think I'll, I think I'll be good. All right, thanks for listening, guys. And uh, gals, and I will talk to you all later.